Yesterday, we highlighted the simplicity, efficiency, and transparency of SAS VIA with an end-to-end -end demo of the model ops lifecycle. Today, we want to go a step further and focus on the analytic innovations we have already delivered to the market. But we also want to give you some sneak peeks into innovations coming over the next year. And with that, I want to welcome our head of analytics and AI, Udo Sklavo. Udo, great to see you. Hi, Brian. Thanks for the introduction. You're right. We're certainly going to talk about how moving at a faster pace ensures increased productivity. But that only matters if you can trust that you have the right technology and checks and balances in place to get the right solution every time. We'll talk about cloud, parallel processing, and how speed and stability are the cornerstone of our latest developments in analytics. Let's take a quick look at the demos coming up. We'll get started with Josh Griffin talking about how we're encoding mathematics in a way that better leverages the design of modern cloud computing. He'll share how you can use less memory to train and score models and train models significantly faster by reconfiguring threading and data paradigms and internal modeling structure. Then we'll have Justin Ferguson and Jonathan Wexler discuss a major area of investment for SAS, data ethics. You learn about model cards and why context and qualitative information is crucial to mitigating bias and promoting more responsible AI. At SAS, we believe it is important to have a healthy balance of accuracy and fairness when it comes to AI models. And I'm excited for you to hear about our efforts to promote transparency and accountability in this area. Our next demo is with Palin Che, who will talk about how SAS analytics can be installed in three easy steps and how it can be the key to your optimization challenges. We'll wrap up this segment of our agenda with Mary Osborne and Jonathan Wexler digging into composite AI, deep learning with natural language processing, and synthetic data generation. Have you ever run into a situation where you needed more reliable data to train a model? Pay special attention to this demo for the latest capabilities and utilities in visual text analytics and visual machine learning. But first, let's hear from Josh. As I mentioned, a lot of our efforts in R&D are concerned with improving our algorithm's speed, cost effectiveness, and repeatability. I have the great pleasure of talking with Josh Griffin today. Josh heads up a team in our Advanced Analytics Foundation Department. Hello, Josh. How are you? I'm great. Hi, Udo. Nice to be here. Can you explain why you and other teams are placing such a large emphasis on these factors, speed, cost, and repeatability? Sure. So speed and performance have always been critical, but one might argue that on the cloud it is even more so. Josh, it's true that more and more customers are migrating to the cloud. Can you talk a bit about how this ties into the economic principles we must consider as a development team? Sure. As customers make this transition, a natural concern to have is what is the actual return on investment? How much of this is hype? How much of this is actual benefits to me? What are the best tax costs, hidden gotchas I might expect? In particular, why SaaS? What advantages does SaaS offer me as I transition to cloud-based analytics? If you recall the Model Studio demo given day one, we saw a number of analytic pipelines like this one. A pipeline like this can be ran in parallel with different option settings to find the best model. Further, if you drill in on a block like gradient boosting, we find not one, but many models trained also in parallel, similarly for neural nets. Thus, with the flip of a few switches, a SAS data scientist can easily make efficient and effective use of almost any size cloud. Thus, the cloud provides the data scientist a real superpower, 
Rather than order and triage ideas, they can at times try them all out simultaneously. This can give the cloud data scientists the appearance of being an oracle, being able to quickly find the right data, the best model every time. This increases productivity and confidence, and arguably the larger the cloud, the more powerful your cloud, the faster you can move in this world. But this comes at a financial cost. At the heart of all of this is speed and stability of the analytics. At SAS, our goal is to give you the same high-quality, trustworthy solutions at ever-increasing speeds. To do this, we attack the problem simultaneously on three levels, redesigning the underlying mathematics of our analytics to better adapt and leverage modern cloud architectures. They say seeing is believing, so I'd like to show a quick demo of how this works. So here I've created two data sets, A and B, and they're going to simulate training data. And what we're going to do is essentially compute the distance matrix between the rows of uh, A and B. And they're of size 500 by 20, quite small. And computing the distance between the rows of A and B is something that is needed by a lot of different products. And in particular, it's needed by support vector machines, k-nearest neighbors, nonlinear PCA, and Beijing modeling, et cetera. The obvious way or textbook way to do this would be to uh, loop over the rows of A, loop over the rows of B, and calculate the distance between the rows of A and B. And I've coded this up for you in a Python block, and I'm going to start it because it takes some time now. And you see it's running. And here I'm essentially looping over the rows of A, looping over the rows of B and calculating the distance between those two. And in this case, this took about six seconds, 6.3 seconds. And the size of the matrix are quite small, 500 by 20. Of course, we want to scale up to big data. How can we do that? Well, we could try to thread this operation and use more of the cores on your system if they're available. We could also try to use GPU devices. And we've heard there's upwards of 100x speed gains. However, can we improve speed without having to use more of your cores or expensive GPU devices? And the answer, fortunately, is yes. If we understand why this is slow, we can redesign our mathematics to make this much faster. And so if you look at this equation here for the norm uh, between A and B, we can see that it has this expansion and we have this A transpose B, which essentially hints that this is a matrix multiply. And so I've coded this up. It looks a bit more complicated and I don't have time really to explain it, but it's doing just this, computing the distance matrix all at once. You see it's near instantaneous. The difference between the two calculations is near machine precision, but the speed up factor is over two, is 255X. And we did this without using more of your cores and we did it without asking you to buy expensive GPU devices. In a pipeline environment, this can translate to a lot of savings since other users and more auto mail can run in this same time frame. Hey, Josh, many thanks for this example. But what does this mean for a customer? Can you talk about a recent customer engagement your team has been involved? Sure, I'd be happy to. Here's a recent success story for this approach. We were contacted by a customer training a random forest model on a data set with roughly 10 million observations and 174 features. They were running on a cluster with four workers, but were not happy with the time and the amount of memory being used. Unfortunately, there's a combinatorial nature to decision trees used in random forest models, where small option changes result in dramatically different model sizes. Our team was asked to investigate. We did a deep dive into the code, hunting for inefficiencies. We found ways to store the same model with less memory. We reordered parallel computations to exploit inherent load imbalance. Last, we redesigned the data the way we access it to reduce cache misses. The end result for the customer was the same algorithm returning the same model, save with 6x less memory, 18x less memory for score and 6x less memory to train. Further, they can now train eight models in the same time it previously took to train just one. Further, because memory is reduced, they can train more models in parallel, which is key to auto ML and pipelining environments. We also performed extensive comprehensive testing on completion to ensure the improvements generalized to other customer use cases as well. Well, this is great. I'm curious if you can provide more details on the efforts we made in R&D to enhance our customer experience and maybe share some results of what we are observing. Sure. 
First, I'd like to start with a baseline customer expectation with respect to threading. Both plots are hypothetical. On the left, we have a measure of analytic RPM. It, it's natural to expect that a routine assigned eight cores will use eight cores 100% of the time, similarly for 16 and 32, hence we have that flat gold line on the left. Naturally, we would hope if we double the computing power from 8 to 16, say, the time should effectively reduce by a factor of 2. The problem with this analysis is real-life products run on physical machines that have unfortunate real-life limitation. Here is a logistic run comparing with three open-source packages. We see the third package, OSP3, seems closest to optimal in that it is using the highest percentage assigned CPU on average, nearly 80%. However, the resulting time for 72 cores is the same as for eight. This is akin to driving a car around in second gear. The energy expended is not resulting in faster speeds. Note, with 72 cores, SAS is 7x faster, but saves over 75% of the CPU for other tasks. Something critical in a multiverse cloud environment. This gives a new insight. The target shouldn't be reduced times at constant energy, but reduced times at even lower energy. And you can see that it's possible if we do, like in the earlier demo, encode it up smartly. At SAS, we have a host of sophisticated tools for monitoring actions as they run on real life problems. This allows us to quickly spot, detect, and address unusual or unexpected expected behavior efficiently and quickly. Next, I'd like to go over some recent improvements my team has made. Note there are other number of other teams doing similar work on their products. Here we see that our linear regression action is 5x faster than Spark, 24x faster than H2O. Further, we are 4x faster than Vita 3.5. This later statistic shows that rate that the rate of progress as we strive for continually and rapidly self-improving. Similarly, penalized regression is 8x faster than Spark, faster than H2O on its debut release. Logistic regression is faster than Spark, 15x faster than H2O, and 5x faster than VIA 3.5. Our random forest is 91x faster than Spark, 5x faster than H2O, and 7x faster than VIA 3.5. For the gradient boosting problems we tested, Spark did not successfully run every time, and so we don't have results. But compared to H2O, we were 4x faster and 9x faster than VIA 3.5. Wow. I need to catch my breath again. So the performance improvements you are reporting are mind-blowing. But there's more, right? Earlier, you talked about the importance of repeatability when dealing with parallelism. Can you elaborate on this, please? Sure. On the cloud, we increase speed by doing computations in parallel. This means that we add numbers in different orders. Unfortunately, the rules of arithmetic do not always apply. This means I can add x plus y to z and get something completely different than adding x to y plus z. Such round-off error can lead to very different results, especially on the cloud where rower ordering of data is not always guaranteed nor controlled by the algorithm seed. So here I'd like to show a demo of repeatability. And I've simulated a data set and made it arbitrarily large, about 50,000 observations. And the reason I wanted to do this is showing that sorting such a data set is not too hard. And to simulate data movement on the cloud, which the cloud randomly does to rebalance itself, I've created shuffle one and shuffle two. But rather than run with those, I'm gonna create copies of those called smart one and smart two. And the difference between the previous ones and these new tables is they're smart enough to remember their original ordering and can recover it with the flip of a switch, which we will show shortly. I've also created this macro, macro forest train and score. And the reason for creating this is just to emphasize when I run the macro, macro that really the only difference between the two training runs that we'll do is the ordering of the data set. And what I'm first going to do is run them without applying this row ordering. So the analytics are going to be fed the same exact da data, but in different orderings. Um, so here I'm going to go ahead and execute this. And so what this is doing is training on HMEQ Smart 1 for us train and score, and the same for Smart 2. And it's going to return uh, the results. And once they come back, it's going to call uh, proc sort and proc on both of them so that we can do a compare. And you see here it's returned. And if we look at the results, the number of observations in that score set that are unequal is almost on the order of the data set itself, over 53,000 
differences. At worst, if you look at the score values, some are going from bad to good and good to bad. And why this is a problem is that you might have to tell your uh, customer that one of the reasons they were denied a loan a large, in large part is due to the time of day that the model was trained and not on the data or anything else itself. So how can we stabilize this so you can get the same high quality answer every time? And here we're just simply going to tell these smart data sets to apply that row ordering. And so when we run it this time, before it feeds the data to the analytics, it's going to reorder it so it's fed the exact same way each time. And again, we're going to compare score one and score two with proc compare when the tables come back. And we see it's returned. And now the big difference is we're getting the same exact score. So there's zero differences. And this allows you to put an anchor in the ground such that Every day you run this, you can get the same answer back. There are other sources of non-deterministic behavior, such as sampling, node thread aggregation, etc., that are beyond the scope of this talk. For now, we just want you to know that SAS is aware and dedicated to repeatable analytics on the cloud, now with the simple flip of a switch. In closing, the cloud permits analysts to try many promising ideas simultaneously. This comes at a very real pocketbook cost, as larger clouds tend to yield better results for a given window of time. At the heart of this cost is speed and repeatability. The faster we run, the fewer times you need to rerun a failed problem, the larger your given cloud. If we are 10x faster, your current cloud is in a really, very real sense now 10x larger. Thank you, Josh. Well, as you can tell, as an R&D team, we have put a lot of efforts into improving our algorithm's speed, cost effectiveness, and repeatability. Thank you so much, Josh, for this exciting update you provided. Now, we're going to hear from Jonathan and Justin about how we are supporting our customers in using AI responsibly. Thanks, Udo. AI technology provides incredible power to make predictions to support intelligent, informed decisions. Trusting machines to have influence over decisions requires intelligent guidance and transparency. Use cases including whether someone gets screened out of a job opportunity, approved for a loan, or offered the appropriate medical treatment can have a great impact on people's lives. And since SAS is providing this AI technology to our customers, we have an obligation to help them use this in a responsible, trustworthy, and fair manner. Justin, what are some of the ways we're supporting our customers in this area? Thanks, Jonathan. We've had a number of features in our entire end-to-end -end analytical environment to support responsible AI for quite some time. Applying automatic detection of private and sensitive information and data, model interpretability, natural language generated explanations of results, and I'm excited to show you some of the newer capabilities around bias detection and mitigation in predictive models, which are primary components of these automated decisions that you just mentioned. Great, let's take a look, Justin. Here in Model Studio, we enable our users to build pipelines to develop machine learning, forecasting, and text analytics models. During this demo, we'll focus on machine learning. According to Responsible AI Best Practices, it's important to identify which attributes might be private or sensitive in nature and understand how the model you develop behave with respect to those attributes. Our goal is to develop a model that best predicts which individuals should be eligible to receive certain economic resources simply based on readily available census data. Naturally, we would not want race or gender to have any impact on these decisions. A common practice for mitigating bias in models is removing input variables from your data. For example, if I wanted to remove the gender variable from the data, I could change the role from input to rejected. What we have found is that models will frequently use proxy variables to represent certain features, even if we do drop them from the data. To ensure that we can detect and mitigate as much bias as possible, I can select these variables to assess the models for bias with respect to the different groups represented in those variables. Doing this allows our users to take a more proactive approach to identifying bias. Now that we've completed our data prep, we can proceed with building our pipelines. For the purposes of this demo, I will be using one of our advanced templates, which includes a variety of prepackaged models for you. 
let's run our pipeline. While our pipeline is running, you'll notice that the nodes will run in parallel, which helps to decrease our overall runtime. Our template is now complete. Let's look at the model comparison node. At first glance, we could easily see that the gradient boosting model outperformed the other models based on our default selection criteria, the KS statistic, and the assigned champion badge. Now that we've identified our champion model, we can focus on assessing the gradient boosting model for bias. When we open our results for this model, we notice a few different result tabs. On the node tab, we see some familiar output like the error plot and the variable importance chart. The assessment tab shows your LIF ROC reports along with fit statistics and event classification. In the fairness and bias tab, we get our first glimpse into the bias metric reports. If we focus on the performance bias plot, you will notice that for the gender variable, there is a difference in accuracy statistics for the different levels. For instance, the multi-class log loss is lower for the female class than it is for the male class. This indicates that the model is less accurate for male observations than it is for female observations. This plot also shows a higher true positive rate in max KS for female observations than male observations. When we look at the prediction bias plot, we can clearly see that the likelihood that a female observation is predicted is significantly higher than the likelihood of a male observation being predicted. The difference between these two observations is illustrated by the maximum prediction difference in the plot in the upper right. We can also generate the same plot for race to see the differences. Justin, from what we've seen here, one would argue that this model is not really fair for different groups of these sensitive variables, right? That's correct. If we use the model to make important decisions that impact people's lives, we could potentially be contributing to discriminatory practices. Maybe innocently, but ignorance isn't a good excuse. When we use sophisticated AI technology to help us make decisions, we need to treat it as if we as humans are still solely responsible for those decisions. Justin, I couldn't agree more. So, SAS is giving you the tools to identify this bias very easily before you make a big mistake and deploy the models into your large-scale decision-making process. But now what? How can we remedy this so that we can still use machine learning models in a fair manner? Well, this is where we turn to what is known as bias mitigation. At this point, we're assuming the data we're using to train these models has sufficient and appropriate representation for all groups. If that's not the case, you've got a problem at the data level that needs to be fixed. And SAS data management provides a good profile of your data and tools to identify this up front. So hopefully that's all taken care of before you even get to modeling. Then there are some manual post-processing steps you can take to make adjustments to your predictions to make them more fair. But what we've done is provided a utility that will automatically make adjustments during the model training process to achieve better balance between overall model accuracy and fairness of a model when used for different groups. Here I'll add in a node that uses the new mitigate bias action to call the model training process in an iterative fashion. The model will automatically make adjustments to the weight supplied to the observations for the different classes to adjust the model in the direction of equivalent accuracy for the sensitive variables. As you can see, this is currently provided as a customized code node, and we'll be packaging this up as a formal node with a UI for the properties like all the other nodes in the near future. So let's run our model so we can see the improvement. Now that we've rerun our pipeline, let's take a look at the model comparison node first. Again, based on the KS statistic, we can see that our new mitigated gradient boosting model didn't do as well as the original gradient boosting model. The reason for this is because we're forcing the prediction of the different levels of gender to converge towards each other, which will impact the accuracy of the model. 
It's important to note that the mitigate bias action was not run on any of the other models in our template. So comparison shall only be made between our champion model and the mitigate bias model. It's also important to keep in mind that our mitigate grad boost model is only mitigating bias for the gender variable. Let's take a look at our final results. Recall that in the original gradient boosting model, the maximum prediction difference between male and female observations was 0.18. In our new model, we notice that the maximum prediction difference has dramatically decreased to 0.02. So in summary, we have successfully mitigated bias for the gender variable, specifically for prediction bias parity, or the average prediction for the event level. Another way to view these training results is to navigate to the node tab and expand the output table. Here we can review a plot of the average prediction for the event at each iteration. Here you will notice that the female prediction starts high and converges down, and the male prediction starts low and converges up as their weights change. Whenever the tolerance is met, the algorithm stops. Wow, Justin, this is an amazing capability SAS is providing to enable data scientists to play a vital role in the responsible and trustworthy use of AI. We often think of data scientists as focused on developing the most accurate models and not necessarily being in touch with some of these larger issues. It's critical that they receive transparent explanations and guidance on what the model's intended use and expectations are. You're absolutely right. One of the newest features we're working on that I'm really excited about and that is coming soon is the introduction of model cars. With the growing use of machine learning models for high impact tasks, Model cars will enable our users to continue to promote transparency, explainability, and accountability during the model building process. This will assist in cutting down on the number of errors and failures reported regarding machine models. That sounds great. So who is the target audience for SAS model cards? The short answer is anyone interested in the problem the model is trying to solve. Model cards cater to your model and software developers, policymakers, and even the impacted individuals. We've developed model cars to provide a visual representation of key metrics at the intersection of accuracy and fairness. Our model cars will give both our technical and non-technical users the ability to gain a comprehensive understanding of the machine learning models that are built in their organizations. I'm excited to see what's in store. Sure thing, let's take a sneak peek. A model is worthless without context. So we wanted to center our model cards around the qualitative information that gives machine learning models meaning. Imagine if prior to starting your model building process and even prior to starting the data prep process, you were given the information like the primary use cases, the intended users, out of scope use cases, relevant factors, and even any caveats or recommendations. Our model cars provide this information front and center for anyone interested to see. And in the case where some of this information might be missing, it also empowers you to ask the appropriate questions that will ultimately shape the model building process. Next, let's transition to the data input tab. Here we provide information on all things data. You'll see at the top a link to the original data set and just below some details around the data. In this section, we provide information such as where to find the data set, if it is publicly accessible, the number of instances, the number of duplicate or conflicting records, potential sensitive variables, and the target variable. Lastly, let's transition to the model wellness tab. On this tab, we jump straight into the results of our model. Our model card provides a brief description of the model using SAS's natural language processing capabilities. Users are given a list of the decision thresholds that were used to assess the model. Users are given the ability to toggle between the fairness and accuracy tabs that show up to three key metrics for each focus area. Within each focus area, users are also given the ability to select each metric to view the associated output off to the right. In this case, we have selected prediction bias, which generated the appropriate plot from the output directly on the card. In the upper right hand corner, we have also provided our users with a grid view heat map of where the model sits at the intersection of accuracy and fairness. 
The goal should always be to have a healthy balance of accuracy and fairness, which is illustrated by the shaded green area. We do understand that not all models are assessed in the same way, so we are also providing the ability to adjust the thresholds of the heat map to cater to the user's specific use cases. Additionally, we are providing transparency and accountability by keeping track of the model version, last updated date, who modified it, and ultimately who approved it once approval is requested. And because we understand the value of privacy, this information will only be available to individuals with the appropriate permissions within your organization. Thank you, Justin. As you have just seen in this very brief demo, SAS is fully committed to providing a completely transparent model building experience. As ethical policies become mandatory, we are embedding responsible AI at the very foundation of all of our analytical offerings. It is our moral and ethical duty to innovate responsibly. Back to you, Udo. Thank you, Justin and Jonathan. Responsible AI is so important, and I'm excited to see the work being done to ensure the AI we're using is responsible and fair. Next, Pelin will show us the power of SAS on a desktop. You may have heard about the SAS betting lab, which was covered in many national news outlets. We used our software to help children improve their betting performance while introducing them to data literacy. To learn more, please tune into the super demo and breakout sessions this afternoon. The reason I bring this up is that I would like to introduce Palin Che, a manager in our Advanced Analytics Center of Excellence, who will perform a demonstration with a baseball theme. Palin. I understand your husband would like to visit the ballparks which are listed on the last games of the Major Baseball League. And he would like to visit them within a three-week window. Is this an optimization problem? Yes, it is. There is a problem known as traveling salesman problem. In that problem, the salesman must visit all the given set of cities once, and the goal is finding the optimal tour that minimizes the total distance traveled. By the nature of this problem, when the number of cities increases, the complexity of the problem increases significantly and becomes a very challenging problem to solve. In this case, my husband's problem is known as traveling baseball fan problem, which includes traveling salesman problem constraints and incorporates the scheduling constraints. This becomes much harder than traveling salesman problem. Hmm. I understand. Can we use SAS to tackle this challenge? Yes, we can. When I wanted to solve the traveling baseball fan problem, I needed to access SAS platform, which I can easily deploy and use to solve my problem. While I was looking for my options, I found what I needed. SAS has a production product named Analytics Pro, which is a containerized analytics programming environment, which combines many analytics capabilities. Let me show how easy to deploy this product. For this demonstration, I completed a couple of installation steps, such as the installation of Docker, order of the Analytics Pro Advanced Programming, which includes the licenses and certificates of the product, and downloading them, downloading SAS Container Manager, and creating the directory that I am going to use to deploy Analytics Pro. At this point of the installation process, the deploy directory should look like this. Now I am ready to install the container image and start the container by running the container manager commands from the deploy directory. For that, I open PowerShell and run the following command to install the container image. After the step is completed, which may take a couple of minutes, I am starting the container with the following command. Now I am ready to log in SAS Studio. For that, I enter the following URL to my web browser. I retrieve the username and password from the authinfo.txt file under systemo folder. After entering my username and password, Analytics Pro is ready. All right, in a few simple steps, you were able to install SAS Analytics Pro on your laptop. That is amazing. 
So, how do we go about optimizing your husband's travel schedule? All right. I would like to begin with introducing the blog post for the traveling baseball fan problem. Rob Pratt has a blog post on this topic, which covers 30 ballparks on Major League Baseball games from 2015. This blog post begins with the discussions about how to find the optimal tour for a traveling salesman problem. Then, the blog post shares how the input data is collected and continue, continues with the optimization model formulations. Later in the blog post, we can see the optimal trip plan for 30 ballparks. You can access different model formulations from the paper mentioned in the blog post. I am going to use both the network formulation and the secondary objective models from the paper. In this demonstration, we are going to solve the same problem for 2022 with limited time frame and ballparks. I have already collected the data that I need for the games, the ballparks that are going to be traveled, and their location information. So let's carry all the application folder into this platform. To be able to do that, I copy my project folder and paste it under SysDemo folder. Then, by refreshing the directory, I can access my application folder. I created a runner file, which includes various steps in different macros. Let's open my runner file to have more details about this application. I upload my libraries and macros, then run my first macro to visualize 15 cities that the final baseball games are going to be played on October 5th at 15 ballparks, and my husband would like to visit all of them. Here are the 15 cities that the trip plan will cover. Next, I have the three-week time window to plan the trip. Let's review the game data that shows the games that are going to be played at those 15 ballparks for three weeks. When I run this macro, we can see that the planning interval begins on September 15th and ends on October 5th. There are 162 games that are going to be played within this time window at those 15 ballparks. As you can expect, there can be different trip plans from the available game and ballpark combinations. So our objective is not finding any trip plan but finding the minimum time between the start of the first attended game and the end of the last attended game, so that we minimize the total duration of the trip. That also means I am looking for a trip plan if that can be shorter than three weeks. I am going to solve this problem using SESOR. So let's run the network formulation model which minimizes the total duration of the trip plan and covers all 15 ballparks. This problem formulation is a mixed integer linear programming problem, and the mixed integer linear programming solver finds the optimal trip plan very fast for this scale and formulation of the problem. Let's check the optimal trip plan from the map by running this macro. And this is how the trip plan looks. The number and city labels are based on the order of the cities that are going to be visited. This plan creates the minimum total duration based trip plan. And I wonder if there are any alternative plans that minimizes both the total duration and total distance traveled. For the answer to this question, I should run the other model named as a secondary objective, which includes side constraints on total duration into the network formulation. When I run this macro, we are going to be able to see if there is any alternative plan. An optimal solution is found. Let's check the results from the map. And we are running the, this macro. We can see that the order of the visitor cities changed compared to the first plan. As we can see, the first two visitor cities are same. However, the third visitor city is changed from Baltimore to Arlington. And the order of the other cities from both east and west coasts are also changed. At the last step, 
Let's review the details of the optimal trip plan, which is based on minimum total duration and minimum total distance traveled. We can see that the optimal plan does not use all three weeks. The trip starts on September 21st, which saves six extra days from our allowed planning time window. And the total distance traveled is less than 1,300 miles compared to the first trip plan. Now the trip plan is ready. Excellent. Pelin, where can we find more information about Analytics Pro and our SaaS optimization software? For Analytics Pro documentation, you can refer to this website. For a press blog post on traveling baseball fan problem, you can visit this website. You can find the optimization models that are used in this demonstration from this GitHub repository. For SAS optimization documentation, you can refer to this website. And you can access SAS community on optimization from this website to ask your questions on SAS optimization and connect with other SAS optimization users. That was such a great conversation, Pelin. Now, let's talk about how Composite AI is changing the way we handle data with Jonathan and Mary. Thanks, Udo. As you've learned throughout this program, at the heart of modern platforms lies analytical innovation. The use of machine learning has exponentially grown to the point where it is being applied across many domains. Composite AI bridges the once great divide between statistics, machine learning, natural language, and deep learning. In this session, you will learn how SAS is innovating in two areas. The first being the use of neural networks within natural language processing, and the second will be the use of tabular GANs to generate synthetic data. Our first speaker is Mary Osborne. Welcome, Mary. Thanks, Jonathan. We'll start by talking about natural language processing and a framework called BERT. BERT is an open source neural network based framework developed by Google. It stands for bi directional encoder representations from transformers. BERT is the first NLP technique to rely on self attention, which means the sentence will look at itself to determine how to represent each token. In other words, BERT was designed to help computers understand the meaning of ambiguous text by using surrounding text to, to determine context. Sentences can often become more ambiguous as they get longer. The bidirectional nature gives BERT the ability to consider the effect of all words in a sentence instead of relying solely on the left to right momentum that biases words towards a certain meaning as a sentence progresses. In order to have a variety of context, the original framework was pre-trained using text from Wikipedia to give it a base layer of knowledge to build on. So what's BERT used for? BERT can be used for many NLP applications, making it the jack of all trades in NLP frameworks. It can determine how positive or negative a movie's reviews are. It can help chatbots answer your questions. It can predict your text when writing an email. It can write an article about a topic with just a few sentence inputs. It can quickly summarize long legal contracts. It can differentiate between words with multiple meanings, like bank, based on the surrounding text. This is called polysemy. This can be a really big issue when it comes to sentiment. Think about the word sick. A gamer might say, this game is sick. In that context, it means the game's really good. If someone says, my brother is sick, he may be really cool, which is another polysemy example, or he may have a cold, yet another version of polysemy. Isn't language fun? Next, we'll take a look at some output from a BERT-based model. In this release, BERT sentiment is only available as a CAS action. We've had sentiment capabilities for over a decade using a rules-based approach. After we take a look at the results from BERT, we'll take a quick look at the rules-based approach so you can see the best of both worlds. These are the results of a BERT-based sentiment model. You can see there are bars for none for no sentiment, things like, can you grab eggs? There's positive for positive sentiment, things like, get excited for today's jog around the lake. Negative for negative sentiment, things like, those forest fires are terrifying. And then mixed for situations of mixed sentiment, things like, sorry, this is the best I can do. This is visual text analytics. Visual text analytics gives us the ability to analyze text in a pipeline. So data feeds into concepts for information extraction. Concepts feeds into text parsing for parsing the data, giving you things like parts of speech. That feeds into sentiment where the magic happens. And with sentiment, you can actually build your own models or use out of the box. This example is going to show us out of the box sentiment. Sentiment results are shown through the topics node, which we're gonna take a look at in just a second. That's going to give us the ability to look at additional feature extraction, as well as sentiment. 
So you have the topics at the top, but what we want, what we want to focus on is the sentiment at the bottom. So we have text like, I was disappointed by the customer service. That shows up as negative sentiment with a negative little frowny face. We also have, this miter saw is excellent. It makes very precise cuts and is strong enough to be hauled around the job site day in and day out. That's representative's positive sentiment with the smiley face. Wow, Mary, BERT really is powerful. You mentioned that rules-based modeling has been in use by SaaS customers for years. Can you elaborate on the trade-offs between BERT and a rules-based approach? Sure thing. Like most machine learning techniques, BERT does require a lot of data to train. Data volumes can increase processing time, and that can increase costs to run over a rules-based approach. That may sound negative, but the trade-off is the ability to infer meaning based on patterns between words and the wider context of the sentence and paragraph they sit within. With rules, you can clearly see what triggers specific outcomes because rules are not black box. Rules may have a lower entry point, but you have to consider the fact that you need subject matter experts and their time to build robust rules, and the accuracy is wholly dependent on the rules provided. If there's not a rule specified for a scenario, that scenario won't be captured. BERT can provide more nuanced answers than rules because it's designed to understand text more like humans do. Rules would need to be crafted to capture and process nuance correctly. For example, sarcasm. SAS Visual Text Analytics offers the best of both worlds, creating the ability to build hybrid models. Analysts can do things such as use the outputs from rules as inputs to machine learning, clustering based on rule extracted concepts, or using rules-based classification and then using machine learning for the data that doesn't have matches. You mentioned the production of black box models. As we discussed the notion of responsible AI earlier today, the use of machine learning necessitates taking fairness and bias into consideration. Can you provide some guidance around the use of BERT within natural language processing with respect to transparency in regulatory environments? Absolutely. When transparency matters, it's typically more appropriate to stick with a rules-based approach rather than using a framework like BERT. Because rules are developed by humans, it's easier to understand how the rules are triggering and delivering the results that are being presented. BERT's more of a black box approach, and while you can peel back the onion, it can be more time consuming and challenging to get to the heart of why the model's triggering the way it is. Mary, it's really amazing to see how far natural language has come, especially with the proliferation of machine learning approaches available. Let's transition to our second machine learning demo. As you just showed with BERT for natural language processing, we're seeing deep learning used as a foundational component for many of the modern AI algorithms these days. But we also know that to effectively train models using these algorithms, you need a lot of data. And while it seems like we're practically swimming in data these days, we don't necessarily always have enough of the right data for every process or behavior we're trying to model. What can we do in these situations? You're right. While machine learning models are becoming incredibly powerful, they're also increasingly data hungry. Perhaps surprisingly, a big challenge that almost all data scientists encounter is not the lack of choice of machine learning algorithms, but the scarcity of data, especially high quality data. Real data is expensive to collect and properly annotate, especially when it's in large scale. Real data can also be messy, requiring time to clean and extract useful features. It can be imbalanced, which makes it harder to train good models. And it can be sensitive to share or store due to privacy concerns. Thinking back to the demo Justin gave earlier about responsible AI, sometimes you just don't have sufficient representation of all groups for sensitive variables, which can lead to biased models. And it's always good to have more data to validate your models and the decisions they influence. Whatever the reason, you very often just need more data. However, acquiring new data can be expensive and time consuming. For these reasons, synthetic data generation is a possible solution. Synthetic data can be artificially manufactured by special purpose machine learning models in a way that captures the data distributions and patterns while also helping to maintain privacy without exposing real information. We're using a state-of-the-art algorithm known as a Generative Adversarial Network, or GAN, to learn these patterns and, re and relationships in existing data in order to generate new observations that are indistinguishable from real data. It's a highly successful class of models for synthetic data generation, particularly for image data. You've probably seen this used for what are known as deep fakes, creating very realistic images of people that don't even exist. But we can also use the same technology for tabular data, which is most common for training predictive models with machine learning algorithms. Our demo will showcase the use of tabular GAN to generate synthetic data. We'll be using SAS Studio with VIA to run a series of programmatic steps known as swim lanes. For our demo, we'll use anti-money laundering or AML data. AML data is considered highly confidential by financial institutions and typically can't be shared with vendors. To circumvent this limitation, such data is sometimes anonymized, for instance, by simply removing columns of identifiers or by adding perturbation. 
However, data generated in this manner will still have a one-to-one -one relationship to the real data. And it's still possible to re-identify if attackers possess, for instance, biographical information. Instead, tabular GANs are generative models whose output is created from completely random values in their internal latent space. Therefore, the new data synthesized by a tabular GAN is highly unlikely to have a one-to-one -one relation to any record in the original data set. Now, let's take a close look at the flow that we built in SAS Studio. Our patented implementation of tabular GANs also uses an autoencoder internally to preserve the pairwise correlation structure in the data. So we're not just capturing the distributions of individual variables, we're capturing the relationships among them. To save time, I've already run the flow. We plotted the density functions of synthetic and real data to check the similarity in distribution. We log transformed annual income beforehand. We can see that the synthetic data and the original data are very close in distribution. In the next step, we plot the correlations of the two data sets. Let's focus on the upper triangle. The color reflects the scale and correlation. If the correlation is close to zero, then the color is white. Otherwise, the darker color corresponds to the larger correlation either positive or negative. Great news. The plot shows the model captures and preserves the correlation from the original data very well. We can now safely use our model. Your demo showcased how powerful SAS is for data scientists to methodically work through a process for generating synthetic data. What you just showed was a programmatic approach. What is SAS working on to support users who may be more comfortable working within a low-code or even a no-code experience, such as Model Studio? I'm glad you asked. The flow I showed here in SAS Studio does package up the code to make it a bit more approachable for non-coders. That being said, we're in the process of building a UI-driven utility for synthetic data generation. So if you're early on in data preparation and recognize the need for more data, or you need to balance your data, or if you're in the model development phase and realize you need more data either to train your models or to validate them, you can simply launch this utility and kick off training of a new GAN or using the one that's already been trained for this data. No need to code anything or even understand the techniques being used. And you'll get back the same sort of assessments to compare the synthetic data to the original data, giving you the confidence that it's representative and appropriate to use. Thanks again, Mary. As you can see, SAS is well positioned to deliver a comprehensive experience to not only generate synthetic data programmatically, but also expand our reach into the low code user base. The use cases for synthetic data are expanding every day across all industries. Stay tuned for exciting advancements from SAS in this evolving area of machine learning. Back to you, Udo. As the founder and future of analytics, we continue to invest in R&D to provide our customers with access to the latest innovations. Today, we picked four areas which we are particularly proud of. And I certainly hope you enjoyed all our demos. Many thanks again to all the presenters. Great job. You may wonder what this all means for you as an end user. To illustrate how our customers are taking advantage of our latest innovations, we invited Dan Beitzel of First Solar to talk about leveraging SaaS image analytics to improve their production processes. Hello, my name is Dan Beitzel and I'm the data science manager at First Solar. Today I would like to talk to you about how we are embedding a computer vision model in an analytic pipeline to improve our production operations. I lead a team of data scientists and engineers who provide statistical analysis, data visualizations, and advanced modeling solutions for our global manufacturing, engineering, and operations. We are currently focused on implementing Industry 4.0 initiatives throughout the manufacturing process. First, a quick uh, introduction to First Solar. We are the Western Hemisphere's largest solar manufacturer and have a 2.4 gigawatt manufacturing plant located in Perrysburg, Ohio, where my team and I are located. Our manufacturing line is a fully integrated continuous process flow with quality control under one roof. We start with a raw sheet of glass that moves through the production line, and about three and a half hours later, we have a fully functional solar panel. We have a differentiated thin film technology designed and developed here in the United States. Our panel is a single large glass substrate versus multiple silicon wafers. And as you can see in the picture, they are large, measuring about two meters by 1.2 meters. We offer the lowest carbon PV technology and have the lowest life cycle environmental footprint in the, in the industry. As mentioned, we have a fully automated and integrated production line that is processing these large glass panels. At times, a panel will break along the line. 
This is a top-down view of one of the sections of our production line and where we focused our, our attention for our, our proof of concept. Panels exit the tool and travel down the conveyor sections. There are currently broken glass detectors, or BGDs, at various locations to determine if the panel is whole or broken. If the panel is determined to be broken, it will pass to the right into the yellow dumpster. If it is whole, it will continue down the conveyor to the next operation. This system works fairly well, but the BGD does have limited detection area and is only able to detect a broken panel as it passes through. If the panel breaks after passing the detector, it can cause an issue at downstream processes. Rarely, a panel that breaks can leave a piece on the conveyor section and cause the subsequent panels to be stalled and back up to the tool. The goal of the computer vision solution is to continuously monitor the entire conveyor sections and be able to detect a broken or stalled panel at any section of the line, and then send a signal to the PLC to send to the panel to either the dumpster or signal an alarm if the panel is stalled so an operator will be able to clear it. As the panel moves through the conveyor, we can see the panel appears to be broken shortly after exiting the tool. This broken section maintains along with the, the whole bigger piece of the panel until after it passes the, the BGD, and that's where it actually shows if it's broken. So in this case, the broken glass detector would not have detected this panel is broken, and this panel would have been able to process further down the line. So again, our target KPIs are minimizing the downtime, increasing the productivity, and reducing costs. Our solution must balance accuracy, latency, and cost ability to scale. Considering accuracy with high yield goals, we need to be not only identify the broken panels, but cannot afford to misclassify whole panels as broken. Latency is important in order to act on the model prediction. At the beginning of the exit of the panel, it's moving slowly and offers early detection. But if the panel breaks along the high-speed transfer section, it only has a few seconds to be classified and removed. And of course, we need to always balance costs and our ability to scale. This is a visualization of our analytic pipeline at First Solar. We start with the camera, and it's connected with an RTSP vision stream connected to the analytic pipeline. And that consists of a computer vision model deployed as part of an event stream processing pipeline that incorporates pre and post processing residing on an edge GPU device. The output is sent via REST API to the manufacturing execution system. This again interfaces with the PLC on the line to, pr to process the panels. Our development journey really focuses on uh, three main parts that we're going to, as we process from uh, our timeline and our increase in accuracy. It focuses on the, the pre processing, the actual model development, in this case, the UNET segmentation model, and post processing for panel wise prediction. At first, we trained a UNET model on the entire video frame. Here is the representative architecture. It is an encoder decoder based design that generated pixel wise predictions. We started with four classifications, background, whole panel, broken panel, and cracked panel, but quickly decided to focus only on whole versus broken. Additionally, we decided to crop the frame so the model could better focus on the area of interest with better resolution. Next, we needed to go from pixel wise prediction to panel wise prediction using contour detection to group pixels belonging to the same class. In this case, the green pickle pixels are whole panels and red pixels are broken. A given contour has multiple pixel predictions, so we set a threshold to determine the overall panel prediction. We also noticed that the contour detection at the beginning would tend to overlap due to the closeness of the panels. So we use the panel dimensions to split the contours and give us better detection between them. Additionally, we added object tracking and time aggregation. The UNET model is not perfect, and at times will bounce between whole and broken. Using an object tracker and time aggregation, we can smooth out the erroneous predictions. For example, we can set the model predictions for three out of five frames before switching the output classification from whole to broken. Additionally, we split the image into four different zones or geofences that correspond to the conveyor sections so that we can send the appropriate signal to the PLC to take action in the correct conveyor section. The output is a continuous signal for all four geofences, whether there's a panel present and if the panel is whole or broken. 
due to the speed differences in the conveyor sections, we found we needed to use different sampling rates for the different sections to get a balanced sample. We also used data augmentation techniques to increase the variation of the training data set. Random crops were used to generate multiple crop frames. Brightness and contrast augmentation was used to contact to account for light variability in the training data. And finally, we used vertical flips. The final result, we can see the panels be tracked with reliable predictions. The panel predictions are overlaid and the geofences are indicated by the blue lines. You'll notice that the panel is classified as broken early on once it exceeds the threshold for broken pixels and maintains that prediction as it proceeds. There is one instance when the panel reverts to whole, but the output remains broken due to the object tracking and time aggregation pieces that we added. That way we ensure that the actual prediction of the panel that gets processed to the VLC is correct. Our journey, really, first solar, we started from ground zero for this POC starting in mid to late January. The first phase was focused on feasibility and model development. We needed to get basic hardware in place, getting the camera and network video recorder so we can collect the video clips of broken and whole panels. Because the broken events are rare, it took time to collect these videos and send a SAS for labeling and model training. At this point, the model accuracy was based on pixel-wise accuracy, for the general modeling criteria of misclassification rate and overall loss functions. And initially, there was not much variation in either the whole or broken plates, but the models were performing fairly well on a few holdout samples. As we collected more samples and the variation increased, we found a few examples of non-uniformities in the whole panels that were troublesome for the model predictions and struggled to find sufficient training data. This took a few months to get a fairly representative sample and a few model iterations through, through the process. The second phase focused on the continued model refinement and initial development and deployment. This was much more collaborative phase. We had meetings throughout the week with SAS team to discuss challenges and have knowledge transfer sessions. First Solar was able to get an edge device installed in our manufacturing domain tied to a test PLC. We installed the event stream processing software and ESP pipeline on the device and deployed the model in the test environment. This allowed us to, to actually have the output actually and take the output and analyze it to see how the, the final predictions were faring on the prediction line. The initial deployment showed good accuracy in detecting the broken plates, but also predicted a fair number of whole panels as broken. S still, this allowed us to understand the variation in panels that we needed to collect, to add to the training data, and in what geofences the model was struggling. These observations led to changes in the P and pre and post processing that continued to improve panel-wise accuracy as discussed previously. Additionally, First Solar took over the labeling so we were able to identify and label new videos and pass that back to SAS team for model refinement. They then passed those results back to us that we deployed on the edge device for analysis of the output. In this way, we were able to make more frequent model iterations, cutting the time significantly for these cycles. The third and most recent phase has been handoff of the model training and pipeline refinement. First Solar added a GPU server to our SAS Azure environment, which allowed us to begin training model iterations ourselves. We had a champion model that performed really well with respect to whole panel classification and gross broken, but still struggled on smaller broken panels. We introduced some new training data and have went through several combinations of different training sets, both training from scratch and using transfer learning to develop several challenger models. We have multiple of these challenger models deployed and are able to analyze the outputs to further cut down the learning cycles and improve the overall design accuracy. We are now getting prepared for our final factory approval testing to implement fully on the production line. As we prepare for the successful implementation of this, of this single location, we are looking ahead to the deploying the current champion model in additional locations of the POC tools. We'll start with sister locations that are identical with respect to the number of conveyors. But some of these, these tools have longer conveyor sections. So we're gonna to need to adapt the number of geofences and the panel geometry accordingly. We have taken steps to parameterize these factors in the ESP pipeline for easier modification. We've actually started testing the current model in these scenarios without those modifications and are seeing some promising initial results. There are other locations with similar panel orientations, but at the entrance, we have tools where the panel orientation is different or sections where multiple panels will be need to be tracked. Finally, in addition to the coded panel, we have sections of the line that have laminated panels and non-coded panels that will also introduce different characteristics for a broken panel to be detected. 
we are confident after going through this journey and learning cycles that we'll be able to successfully handle these next challenges. I would like to thank the SAS IoT and R&D Advanced Center of Excellence teams for their cooperation and collaboration throughout this journey. I hope you enjoyed this presentation. If you are interested, there's a 30 minute breakout session later that will go further into technical details of the project. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Dan, for all the information you provided. It is wonderful to see how First Solar is using artificial intelligence and streaming data engines to improve their production process. It is my great pleasure now to introduce Stu Bradley, Senior Vice President of Fraud and Security Intelligence at SAS. Stu will help us understand how we are enabling decision-making across fraud, risk, and marketing, which we like to refer to as enterprise decisioning. Udo, thank you very much for that introduction. I'm excited to be here with you all today at SAS Explore. I have the privilege of being able to build upon the concepts around SAS VIA and the analytics lifecycle that have been discussed over the last two days. One of SAS's biggest differentiators is our solutions that are built upon SAS VIA and leverage the analytics lifecycle from the data ops capabilities to the model development capabilities to the model ops capabilities to achieve the last mile of value. The difference is that our solutions have embedded intellectual property that are geared towards solving a very specific industry domain problem. From fraud detection to market risk calculations to how do I provide the next best offer to my customer from a marketing perspective. All of these come together in the concept of enterprise decisioning. There's many drivers in the marketplace today that are driving the need for enterprise decisioning. The first of which is competition. There's no shortage of new and aggressive competition in your marketplaces today, from the fintechs to the insurtechs, the regtechs, the govtechs, and the big techs that are all driving new levels of innovation that are changing the way they engage with their consumer or beneficiary and traditional organizations are having a hard time keeping pace. Which leads me to the second driver, which is the acceleration of digital. Clearly the pandemic accelerated digital merely for survival of many organizations. The next phase of digital is gonna be driven for automation. And digital now is table stakes when you consider the importance of the millennial generation that they now have on our overall economy. The third driver is customer behaviors. There's no doubt that the pandemic changed the customer behavior profiles, which requires organizations to have the agility to pivot to those new behaviors such that they can make the right decisions on behalf of their customers. And finally, risk. Every new digital application that has been rolled out increases the overall attack surface that must be protected from a fraud and a security standpoint. Again, the agility to pivot to the new fraud typologies that are out there, as well as the broadened number of digital applications is paramount for good risk posture. So with all of these drivers, how do you boil down the initiatives in a few words. In my engagement with executives, it comes down to simple, rewarding, and safe. How do you simplify every interaction? This means the elimination of the multitude of touch points from a customer engagement standpoint. Think of a more integrated digital as a service capability where you have integration everywhere. Integration with apps, integration with social media, integration with retailers, integration with data ecosystems that allow you to make better and more holistic decisions. On the rewarding side, it's about how you make every customer or beneficiary engagement more meaningful. Now I'm gonna throw some buzzwords at you right now because this is about a hyper 
personalized and contextual engagement model embedded across customer journeys. Think of this as IoT, artificial intelligence, and automation all working symbiotically together to collect data, make decisions, and automate those decisions on behalf of your enterprise. And then, of course, safety, about managing risk while meeting the ever-increasing regulatory expectations. Now, clearly, the pandemic led to an urgency in understanding the customer behavior, the changing customer behaviors from a risk standpoint. And this makes it paramount to be able to leverage not only your internal data, but create a third-party data ecosystem such that you can leverage all of the data available to best manage risk for your organization. So when you think about enterprise decisioning, this is the ability across a wide spectrum of decisions like fraud, risk, and marketing to make those decisions on a single architecture across the entirety of the customer lifecycle and the discrete customer journeys therein. So many organizations have built their applications in silos, siloed based upon operations as well as technology. Enterprise decisioning breaks down those silos and allows you to create a more holistic engagement with your consumer. From a customer lifecycle standpoint, think of the initial engagement with your customer. In order to open an account or give a credit product, you need to validate the identity, especially important in today's digital world. That means you need to leverage internal and external data to prove that they are who they say they are and that it's not a bot on the other end that's trying to defraud your organization. You then need to make a credit origination decision. You need to be able to price the product and ensure profitability of that product. You need to make an application fraud decision to ensure it's not fraudulent. You also have regulatory obligations around know your customer and sanction screening that need to be done. And then once you've onboarded that customer, as they've started to build up their overall profile with your organization, you need to make decisions around, well, what's the next best offer I want to provide? What additional products do they need to have? How do I increase my wallet share? And if things go south with that customer, you may need to make decisions around, do I restructure a loan? Do I exit this relationship? Do I put them in a collections or recovery process? And then the discrete customer journeys are every discrete engagement with any application within your organization. Let's take a digital example. We need to authenticate them into a digital uh, application. You then need to make a de decision based upon the device that they are using and the biometric footprint that they have. Do I need to use a step up or multi-factor authentication process? Do I allow them to navigate? Do I allow them to make a transaction? And if I authorize that transaction, do I then need to have a post transaction engagement with that consumer, whether it's from a fraud and a risk management perspective, or if it's making that in-app marketing offer that could then increase overall wallet share. So again, decisions across fraud, risk, marketing, the entire customer life cycle and every discrete customer journey. So how do we make this real? To simplify and boil this down, I look at this in four major pillars. The first pillar is data orchestration. Now data orchestration is much about much more than just integration of data and data management. It's logic embedded such that you can optimize the use of the data across the overall decisioning workflow that you have. How you integrate internal and third-party data do I use the third-party data to make a decision, or do I use that third-party data as part of an intelligence gathering or an investigations process? Once we've orchestrated the data, it's then passed into our analytic management environment. This is where the analytic life cycle comes to life. From a model development perspective, I have the data at my fingertips that I can serve up analytic capabilities across a wide set of users from a open source analytics user that can build a model code and deploy that within SaaS to a business user that may need a low code or no code drag and drop environment to build an analytic model. 
I have the ability to create a model tournament using multiple different models of different modeling typologies such that I can optimize the model for the outcome that is desired. I can register these models, I can track these models, I can test these models, and ultimately, I can deploy these models to get that last mile of value that is so elusive in analytic engagements. And that's where the third pillar around execution and alerting comes in. Once I've defined a model that I want to deploy in production, how can I easily, through a common analytic infrastructure, deploy that model into a batch environment, a near time, a real time, or even at the edge environment, such that I can optimize the execution based upon the decision that needs to be made. And alerting is really important when we start thinking about the fraud decisions that we need to make. Being able to create and aggregate information that can be rapidly and readily triage such that a decision can be made from a fraud perspective without impacting the overall customer experience becomes paramount. And then the last pillar is around intelligence and investigations. Intelligence comes into play for those automated decisions where we're gathering intelligence to create information around the decisions that have been made such that we have a feedback loop to continue to enhance our models. And of course, the investigations, the long form investigations that need to happen with a workflow driven, analytic embedded capability such that you can then leverage things like robotic process automation to automatically pull data for investigative typologies and file the appropriate regulatory reports. So for the technical audience, how does it work? So on the right hand side, you have the different decisions that you would look to make across the customer lifecycle. And on the left hand side, you have a series of different users from an executive user that may be looking for intelligent to an analytics user who might want to write model code to a business user who is going to need a low code, no code environment to leverage the analytic capabilities that they have at their fingertips. And Let's just take an example of a, a low-code, no-code user. And during the pandemic, we were all focused around distribution of funds because we needed to get the economy back in action and the economy going. And now, as we're taking an inventory of all the financing that was put out there, we're in an environment that we need to think about how do I look at the debt I have and which debt is good debt versus bad debt, which debt needs to be refinanced versus which debt needs to be collected upon. So as a business user, I may want to build a collections model. So in my design environment, which is built upon SaaS via, I have all of the capabilities within that analytic lifecycle. So I will take a drag and drop environment and I will create, based upon the outcome I'm looking for, a model tournament of a series of different uh, analytic modeling typologies, and this environment will choose the best fit model for me. I then have the ability to test that uh, against data, register that model once I have uh, a, a model that I think is going to work for my uh, collections needs, and then I can push that into a container registry where I'm registering all of my models. Now, I also have a GitOps environment that will allow me to readily stand up in the cloud, a test environment through which I can then use existing historic data to be able to test that collections model. I would then push that collections model into that test environment and undergo an iterative process where I will tweak and make adjustments to my overall collections model. Once I feel that I've got a model that's going to work, um, I will then go and I will then uh, put that model into a, an integration test environment. This is where we would do all of the model, meet all of the model governance needs, do parallel runs against existing models or rule sets that are out there. And once I feel that I've met my model governance requirements and I've done my parallel runs and I've met the regulatory expectations, I then have the ability to push that collections model into the production environment, and now I can then leverage that same infrastructure to build, test, and deploy models across the entirety of the customer lifecycle. 
Of course, this all comes down to the value equation. I boil this down into three areas, cost reduction, increased revenue and increased customer retention, and the ability to more holistically manage risk. The cost reduction is all about streamlining and reducing IT complexity in eliminating the siloed capabilities that are out there. I like to use an example of a Japanese bank that we're working with that had a multitude of different small to medium business credit lending applications. They created an integrated workflow that was driven by SaaS's decisioning architecture to be able to make decisions across a wide set of lending products on a single infrastructure. This allowed this bank to not only reduce their, com their IT complexity and reduce costs, but also allowed them to make more holistic customer decisions, which resulted in lending 25 million more on an annual basis. From an increased revenue and customer retention standpoint, it's about capturing a greater part of that wallet share in ensuring that your organization is more sticky for the customer. And that happens through a more ro robust customer experience. I like to use a telco example for this uh, with an Australian telco that we're working with that was struggling with the process for post-pay plan upgrades. And they wanted to create a digital journey that would automate those, that upgrade process. And so they decided to use SaaS and SaaS's decisioning architecture to automate those post-pay plan upgrade decisions. And they were able to do that and increase the number of automated decisions they were making by 150%. And as importantly, lay down an infrastructure that in phase two will be leveraged to make fraud decisions for existing and new customers. And then lastly, the ability to look holistically across customers or beneficiaries to manage risk. And for this, I'm gonna use an example of a tax agency that we're working with. And this is all about the agility of an enterprise decisioning architecture that can pivot to make the decisions that are most pressing in today's environment. With this tax agency, they were leveraging our, our, our decisioning architecture to make fraud decisions for income tax. And during the pandemic, by law, they had five weeks to prepare to distribute COVID relief funds and do so in a safe and prudent way. They were able to build a rule set and a model and deploy it on that existing infrastructure such that they could prevent hundreds of millions of dollars in fraud attacks based upon fraudulent identities and organized criminal rings against their COVID relief program. So with that, I wanted to leave you with a call to action. I want you all, as you go back into your daily lives, to think about three things. One, the data ecosystem. What is the data internally and externally that I need to leverage to make better decisions? And then create a roadmap for digital engagement with your customers and your or, or your beneficiaries so you know those different digital touch points, which will also drive the data and the decisions that you need to make. And third, identify the decisions you want to holistically make across the overall customer life cycle and set a roadmap to accomplishing that objective. So with that, I wanna thank you for your time and Udo, I'll send things back over to you. Thanks again to Dan Beitzel and Stu Bradley for sharing their experiences of leveraging the VIA platform for their solution area. This brings us to the end of our session today. I'm excited to hear about the user awards next. Hello, and welcome to our inaugural SaaS Customer Recognition Awards. My name is Kevin Scanlon, and I have the privilege of running our customer engagement marketing teams here at SaaS. And I'm Kimberly May, Senior Vice President of Global Technical Support. We're here to give a big thank you and round of applause to all of our SaaS customers and partners around the globe who help us change the world through analytics. Today, we want to recognize a few of you for your standout contributions over the past year. Thanks, Kimberly. I say we get started. Let's get started. Let's start with our Regional User Group Award. It's presented to a regional user group leader who has demonstrated dedication to and passion for the success of a user group and its members. 
This year's winner is Dee Dee Schreiber Gregory from Juxtapose LLC. Congratulations, Dee Dee. You are well known and loved by our user group community. Next, we have the SaaS Analytics Explorers Award presented to a SaaS customer advocate who is a strong supporter and influencer, both inside and outside, of the SaaS Analytics Explorers program. Congratulations, Jack Liu of BUPA Asia Pacific. We see you, and we are glad to have you in our community. Thanks, Jack. That brings us to our third award, the SaaS Customer Impact Award for the public sector. This recognition is awarded to the, a public sector customer who's had the most impact. It recognizes their willingness to encourage and inspire others by sharing their analytics journey, successes, and lessons learned. This year's winner is Duval County Public Schools. This award will be accepted by the Executive Director, Saul Bloom, of Duval County Public Schools. We appreciate you, Saul, and everything the county does with SAS. On a similar note, we'd also like to present the SAS Customer Impact Award for the private sector, which is awarded to a customer who impacted others through their openness and their success and the lessons they learned throughout their analytics journey. We'd like to recognize Georgia Pacific with this award. Roshan Shah, Director of CSC Operations and Advanced Analytics, will accept the award on behalf of Georgia Pacific. We are very grateful for your support. It's making an impact. Next, we'd like to present the SAS Support Community Hero Award. This is presented to a customer who goes above and beyond, helping others in the SAS support community. Thank you to this year's winner, Tom Abernathy from Pfizer, for consistently providing help and guidance to our SAS community members. We appreciate you, Tom. This one is near and dear to my heart. Our User Feedback Award recognizes a customer who provides valuable feedback on SaaS products and has been an essential reference for product improvements. Thank you, Dr. Kristen Lewald, Statewide Project Director for PDE Lancaster, Lebanon, IU13. We're better because of you, Dr. Lewald. Our final award is the Innovator of the Year Award, and this is presented to a customer who is using SaaS in innovative ways. Congratulations to Pierre Marjorique Lajar and Jean-Francois Plant. We are recognizing these winners from ATC Montreal for the development of Cortex. Cortex is an online analytics simulation game. We are really impressed with your dedication to teaching analytics through gamification and simulation. You make learning fun and hats off to you. Thank you again to all of our winners and our amazing customers and partners who continue to support SAS and act as a driving force behind our success. If you'd like more details on our winner's stories, please visit the SAS Explorer Hub on communities.sas.com. Congratulations again to our winners. And Kimberly, I think that does it for us.